<laughs> anyway, so I think that's people are finding their way in now. For tonight's um, talk, looking at something which I can talk about this evening, uh, realizing that many people get upset, angry, depressed about themselves, their relationships, the economy, the government, and everything else which goes on. That's and so tonight's talk is about hope and how to actually to restore it. Because without hope, it's not good. When we get burdened with looking at the future, with especially our media, always celebrates negativity. And it's so hard sometimes to find nice things to say about people like Mr. Trump. <laughs> <laughs> so can you say something nice about one he's not Australian? Oops, <laughs> I get in trouble for this as usual. But we always sometimes actually need to see the positive side of the future. It is called hope. Depression, negativity, is looking at the future and seeing the negative side of the future. Seeing all the things which might go wrong, to seeing all the terrible events which might happen, and they may happen, but they may not as well. I always remember that uh, a few months ago, you know, one of the things which I do, living on the cutting edge of life with people with cancer, because that's part of my job. It's a nice job too, to help wherever you can. So uh, every twice a year, go to the Cancer Wellness Association in Cottesloe. Is teaching, helping, and apparently it works. That's why they keep inviting me every year to lose count. I said about 26 years on their reckoning. And they say, I asked them, like, why do you keep inviting me? And they said because of an experience which happened after the first time I went there to give a talk. And the first time I went there, they were having trouble with one of their clients who was a middle-aged woman who had a cancer but had gone into remission. She'd recovered. But that wasn't enough for her because she kept worrying about what would happen if it returned. And that was causing her so much stress that she was coming for counseling, coming for some advice, coming for some friendship because she was paranoid. Turning. If you had a cancer going through all those treatments, they're not pleasant. So she had a legitimate fear. And they could not help her. And then this, this weirdo with a bald head and a brown bath bedrobe, <laughs> sort of on my bed sheet rather, comes along and just one little sentence and she fixes her straight away. And you now she's free. And what I said was just something which is so sad it changed her life. Because she was always complaining, worried about what would happen if I get the cancer, if it comes back again. What would happen if it didn't? And to her, you replaced it with hope. A simple thing like that, which she got straight away, she was ready for seeing life in a different way. Fear is what would happen if, followed by something going wrong. Why do you always think of the negativity, what might go wrong? And instead we think of what might go right. That is called hope. The other one is called fear. And it's not as simple as just saying, oh yeah, 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 but... The point is, if you do have that fear and negativity to the future, what would happen if it went wrong? What would happen if the marriage doesn't last? What would happen you know, if I lose my job? What would happen if I lose my house? What would happen if... If we do feel negative like that, you know, and it's so easy to understand why, that if whatever you fear, you make more likely to happen. That woman who was afraid of getting cancer, what would happen if it came back? What would happen if it came back? 
quite frankly, if she hadn't have met me, it would have probably come back. The fear would have made her tense. The fear would stop her just relaxing and allowing her body to become healthy and strong. The very fear, the psychological uh, impact on her body would probably make it so much more likely that the cancer returned. But the hope, what would happen if it didn't? Okay, maybe it's not going to happen. She stops thinking about it, stops worrying about it, goes to enjoying her life, and the fear of cancer not dominating her, her day or her week anymore, She's free, and it never comes back. And it hadn't come back, she was there. 26 years, hadn't come back, thank you so much. Such a simple treatment. But it's not just that, this is happens, this is an example of if we are afraid of something going wrong, we make it more likely to happen. <laughs> Relationships. You have a lovely partner and you think, oh my goodness, what's going to happen if it doesn't work out? What's happen if he's going to leave me, if she's going to run off with somebody else? You become so paranoid, you become a control freak, they can't stand you any longer and they do leave. You know, the usual thing which happens. You're trying so hard because you're afraid, you're not relaxing and you're just a pain in the ass to live with. You get it? But if you think, what's going to happen if it's going to be successful, if it's going to be okay, then of course there's hope, and then it actually does work out usually. Because you're relaxed, you're fun to be with, you're not paranoid, which means it's much more likely that you're going to find success. You do this with students who are doing their exams. It's a bit of a con, but I know it works. They come for blessings. I do the chanting for them. Do the holy water for them. Give them the whole works. It's only water. It doesn't work, okay? It's just water. It's chanting. They haven't got a clue what I'm chanting anyway. It's all in Pali, in ancient language, which they don't understand. But that's not the point. The point is, it gives them hope. The point is, Ajahn Brahm chanted for me, he's a very powerful monk, it's going to work. And it does. That's actually how it works, that's the holiness of water. The powerful message of hope and encouragement which it gives to you, which is why it's wonderful to do it. So, you can see that many of the little ceremonies which monks like me do, they're not just jiggery-pokery, just superstition. There is a point to it because of encouraging something positive in a person's mind. And I know that positivity is incredibly powerful. When I've gone to prisons, prisoners in jail sometimes feel just such a lack of hope. Yeah, I mean they're in jail, crime, they've done something terrible, they're in jail three, four, five years. Most of the especially men I've met in jail, partners leave them, they won't wait. And they notice if they do wait for their partner after three, four, five years, their partner, the guy, finds it so difficult to find a job or even a place to stay. Now honestly, if you're an employer, you know, would you employ somebody who's, say, a raped, who's got a sexual offence or a violent offence or uh, has stolen? There's so many other people to choose from. Of course, they'll be the bottom of the pile. So they don't get jobs. Which means they don't get work, which means they just end up going back again. Just once you get into that cycle. That's one of the reasons why people do take those drugs. It's a, it's a cycle of despair, no hope. And what do monks like me do? I said this before. It just gives me a big boost, something, you know, an achievement which I love remembering. And I've often said this, if someone does praise you, please remember it, because it's worth it, because it makes you a better person, you try and do it again. That's when this prison officer called me at Bodhinyana Monastery several years ago. They said, can you please come back to teach in our prison? And I said, I'm too busy. And he said, no, we really want you to come and, and teach, because I really am a very, very busy monk. Just, Friday night talk, tomorrow morning, four o'clock, leaving here to get to the airport to catch a plane to Indonesia to give a talk tomorrow night in Midland, two hundred and forty four minutes I found out today. And then over to another city, six cities, six talks, six nights, and then when I finally finish, 
Come back here Friday night, another talk next week. <laughs> That's my life. I quite enjoy it. But it means I can't do many other things. So, uh, I told him, look, too busy. I'll send another monk, delegate. But the trouble is, he said, no, we want you. And of course, the next question was an obvious one. Why me? And then he said, and this was one of the greatest compliments I've ever, ever received. He said, because this really hit me in the heart, and oh, this just made me emotional. You know, you know when you've done something, you've really achieved something, and it's really worthwhile, you feel just so much happiness inside. He said, said, reason we want you, he said, I'm about to retire from the prison service. I've been in it all my life, just about. Not when I was a kid, but you know, when I was in my career. And I've noticed something very unique. When you came to our prison, every prisoner you taught, who came to your classes, when they were released, never came back again. They never came back to jail. And I noticed that, and it's weird. But I want that to happen again. Can you please come back? You know, you've actually done something. You've gone to people who are hopeless, and somehow or other, you give them a way out of that terrible in and out of jail. Uh, cycle, and they were free. And I still remember actually one guy, Nick, I remember his name. Oh, this is, okay, I'm going to go off on a tangent, but this is another emotional story which I really, really love. Nick, he came up to me once, because I was at the airport waiting to pick up somebody else, another monk from the airport, and I felt the hand on my shoulder and turned around. It was Nick, I taught him in jail. And he looked at me, he's in a really good suit, he said, look, I'm doing really well now, thank you so much. I'm still meditating, every day I jump I'm still meditating. And I always remember Nick, because he was inside for dealing drugs. And I also remember this occasion once, when I went to teach, arrived at five minutes early, he grabbed me and said, come over here. And on there was a wall, I was teaching meditation in the education uh, part of the education wing of the of the prison, and on the wall there was this huge number of cards, greeting cards, all to Nick, from little five, no, little grade five, grade six children. Nick, thank you for coming to my school. Please come and visit us when you get out. Thank you for what you taught. You know, we'll always remember you. And signed by these little sort of 10, 11 year old boys and girls. Because what had happened, he explained to me, a local school, I can't really tell you which it was, had the guts and the insight to criminals who did drugs to teach their children about the danger of drugs. The year fives, year sixes. And instead of getting psychologists, professors, experts, who know everything but understand very little. They got people who were in prison at that time, suffering, and it's immense suffering, because of they got involved in... And these people, you can imagine the message from suffering and suffering at the time, teaching the children, and that was, would have been powerful. And of course, the kids, being in primary school, the next day, art class, write a little thank you to Nick, and I forget the other prisoner, to say thank you. And this, this was kids from their heart. And I remember this, and I get emotional because I can recall now Nick crying his eyes out, just water, just pouring down both cheeks as he read out what these little kids had said about him. He'd done something. He'd actually helped somebody. Not one, but many kids. He knew from what they said that he had changed many of those kids' lives at a time they were most vulnerable, even in that age. And he felt so good about that. He gave him what I was trying to teach him, but he saw it much better than even I, that he was worth something. He wasn't a mistake. He wasn't a failure. He gave him that hope inside of himself 
that he could achieve things, he could do something, something good and worthwhile. He wasn't a big mistake. He just and from that hope, as soon as he was released from jail, got out and built a good career. It'd be great if, Nick, if you're listening to this, wherever you are, it'd be great to catch up again, find out what's going on in your life. I'm sure you're doing really, really, really well. Because he had that terrible desperation of hopelessness, which many people in jail have, and turn it into something which would give him a, a channel to actually go out into that world and do something good with his life. What a wonderful thing he could do. And it's also to hope that you are a good person. That was the other thing, every time I went to jail and saw people, every time you saw somebody and you had to let them know that they weren't a criminal, they were a person. Huge, and get them to see that. And as soon as a person saw the good side of themselves, that was the job completed. They had hope. Because just as if you look into the future with negativity, it's so easy to look at yourself with negativity, and you feel you're a negative person, and you don't have hope. So many of the social problems, emotional problems, drug problems, are people who think they are worthless. They're not good enough, there's something wrong with them. And there is somebody here today, they asked me earlier, and I promised I'd say this again, uh, the simile of the tree, I know you've probably heard this so many times from me, it's one of my favorite stories, but I promised I would tell them, because they came up beforehand and I didn't have time to tell them. Simile of the tree, action and beauty, the two totally different things. And you don't try and be perfect, try and be beautiful. Deal between perfection and beauty. Go into a forest and find perfect tree. Perfect tree is one which is straight. With all the branches in place. Only green leaves, no yellow leaves, no brown leaves. No leaves which have been chewed by the insects. And a bark which is perfectly smooth. With no black stuff from bushfires. With no damage from storms. A perfectly smooth bark. And branches all in the right place. And I say, if you ever find a tree like that, it will be in a government-run plantation. <laughs> Probably in North Korea or somewhere, <laughs> where everything is controlled in forests. Everything is just all over the place. It is not controlled. The trees are all crooked and bent and damaged and broken branches. And those are the most beautiful trees, aren't they? the ones which you like, the ones which you always go back to and like to look at. The damaged ones are the most beautiful. The perfect ones, yeah, you're not really interested in those. Just like human beings. The perfect ones, whatever they are, they're not interesting or beautiful. The damaged ones, they are the most beautiful. So if you are Damaged goods. Because we use that word. If you are damaged goods, it's important to know that. You belong in the beautiful forests of human beings. You belong. It's beautiful. You are the sorts of beings which I like to hang out with. You're beautiful. Because, as I mentioned a few days ago, perfection is what you see with the brain, with the, the, with the mind. It's just intellectual. But beauty is what you see with the heart. And unfortunately we run by our brain. We're trying to be perfect instead of trying to be beautiful. Which is what you see with the heart. And I saw so many beautiful people in jail. Never saw perfect ones there. <laughs> but beautiful ones, yeah. Now you understand what hope is. The future, it's not perfect. There's going to be lots of problems, lots of difficulties, but there's something beautiful. There's always hope. I think that anybody who's studied any history at all, just look at the facts for goodness. Climate change. I always like to tell people whenever I give a talk on the uh, global warming, climate change, just it can be fixed. Never give up hope. And the reason I say that, 
two little stories. I gave a retreat many years ago when I was in England in this wonderful place called the New Forest, just north of Southampton in UK. It's called New, even though it was planted before uh, Australia became westernized, before what Minister Palaszczuk says, the invasion. I might get in trouble for that, but nevertheless, I think you know what I'm talking about. But, in those, in those days, sort of uh, 300, 400 years ago, England and usually France or Spain or wherever they wanted to, they were always having wars. And many of those wars were fought at sea. And seas needed boats and boats needed wood. And so the Brits, they cut down this whole forest, hundreds of square miles of oak trees and other trees just to the north of their main port, Portsmouth and Southampton. But what the Brits did at that time, they replanted. And 300, 400 years later, you've got this beautiful forest, gorgeous. And there's no way of distinguishing that from a naturally grown forest. They got it back again. It took time, but hope does take time. Or like the other thing I remember, even from my own lifetime, the dear old River Thames. I was born in London, brought up there. In fact, I always say that I was a boy from the bush, shepherd's bush, <laughs> where I grew up. <laughs> that qualifies me for an Australian passport. Where were you born? I was born in the bush. Grew up there, shepherd's bush. It's in West London, by the way. And anyway, <laughs> There I was, used to go walking next to the Thames and I remember as a young kid had these big signs every 50 meters or so, the number you had to call if you fell in to get your stomach pumped out because the water was toxic. You know, if you didn't have your stomach pumped out, get an ambulance straight away if you fell into the River Thames, you would die. It wasn't just no fish could stay in it. Human beings, if you even just fell in it, you'd, you'd die. That's how bad it was. And in my lifetime, it's now clean again. Fish are swimming in that river. It's healthy again. And just the innovative idea which solved the problem was one of the great... Um, Insights, it's a way you solve problems. You know, think outside the box, think a little bit differently and you can solve intractable problems really easily. The problem was they had all these factories and they were all on the banks of the River Thames because they needed the water for their industrial processes. And they were sucking in all this water, polluting it and, and pushing it back into the river again. How can you stop that? Fines, ha ha ha. You'd always be able to find a way outside of fines with a clever lawyer. So instead, they made a law, a very simple law, saying yes, the factories on the banks of the Thames could take as much water as they wanted from the River Thames, but their inlet pipe had to be within, I think, five or ten meters of their outlet pipe, downstream. Whatever they sucked in came immediately from what they sucked out, or they pushed out. The inlet was five or ten meters downstream of their outlet pipe. So it's like your shower water or your washing water you have to suck that back in, first of all, for your next shower. That's what you're going to use next. Which All these factories, they cleaned up their outlet pipes very, very quickly. And that simple law restored the health of that, that River Thames. I say that because it restores hope. It can be done with innovative ideas, simple laws, which means that we can save these problems. Cancers, that's a cancer of planet Earth, cancer of human beings. How can we actually solve that? Sometimes a bit of innovation. 
Because sometimes they're just taking more medications, chemotherapies, or whatever. Is there hope for people with cancer? You bet there is. I've just been around too long to see an amazing stuff happen. Cancers which you know, should be, people should be dead, and they're still alive. Full recession, tumors vanishing. And the reason is because as a monk, I know the power of the mind over the body. And so does simple science know that. Look, that experiment which many of you should know, hypnosis, this, this guy, they hypnotized him and they had a piece of wood with a nail on the end. Very simple equipment, didn't need much to buy a nail and a piece of wood. And they hypnotized this guy to believe that the nail was red hot. It was just room temperature. And they touched the nail on this man's skin. He screamed in pain because he thought it was hot. You can understand that. But to see a blister come up on his skin, that was weird. He basically thought the blister into, ex into existence. He believed it. That's why it happened. He blistered. And there no physical cause for that because the nail was at room temperature. That's one example out of thousands of the power of the mind on your body. If your mind, because you believe it so much, can create a blister, can't the mind do something with, say, cancers? It has to have that training, the confidence, the hope. And that's a problem sometimes. The problem is that sometimes we're hopeless. Sometimes fear, sometimes thinking always sees a negative part of life and we really start to think it's going to get worse, 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 worse. And that takes away our hope. And that's where people die. So sometimes a nice little sprinkling of holy water, a bit of chanting from the monks or from anybody else, whoever can restore that hope, you wouldn't believe the power of that. <laughs> because it restores that hope. There's a possibility, there's a path. And it's not just that, it's not just the faith part of it, it's just getting that faith into your own head, so you don't need to have belief in other people. It's that confidence that you can do that yourself. Which is where I now come to straight outright Buddhism, karma. Karma is not fate. What karma means is you have the opportunity at any time to interfere with destiny, if you want to call it that, with the, the trajectory of your life it means that you can take control and power. It's not controlled by some malevolent spirit up there in the sky somewhere, but by an even more sometimes malevolent and all-powerful being called science. Science can be very malevolent too, without any compassion cause and effect which human beings cannot interfere with. No, you can interfere. I've, hey, I've got it in my bag here. Uh, somebody, one of the scientists, which I met over in Europe, he works in the Large Hadron Collider, he uh, let me know about the AR. You can Google it, P-E-A-R, it's, it's an experiment done on print in Princeton, League universities, it's actually where Einstein used to, used to uh, uh, teach or do his research. Princeton University was doing some experiments on how the mind can interfere with science and found some very positive results, PEAR project. I forget what, Princeton something experimental, something whatever, research program, but how the mind interferes with physical phenomena and proving it does have an effect. And this is one of the things which I really want to sort of promote, that you are not hopeless, you're not just a victim, you can do things. And if you can understand that, that you can interfere, it does give you hope even with the health of your own body. It's not a hopeless case, as you have seen many, many times. And I'd, I was telling someone a few days ago, who had a um, friend of a friend, actually a friend, 
Uh, she had uh, quite advanced lung cancer, never smoked in her life, wondered what was going on. And just I told her that once when I was traveling uh, from uh, Ipo in Malaysia to Penang, I was being driven from that city to Penang to give some more talks. And in the car was an oncologist, a Chinese Malaysian. She was a specialist and she was about to retire six months or so before she retired. And she said something which I would always remember. She said that now I don't need to actually look at the pathology reports or the x-rays. I can tell when a patient comes in, a client comes into my rooms, I can tell with 90% accuracy, she said, who's going to survive and who's not going to survive without even looking at the pathology reports. The attitude said that is the indicator which I have got now. And because she'd been in that job all her life basically, about to retire, an oncologist specialist, she said 90% I can determine whether they're going to survive or not because of their attitude. And I always remember what she said because I totally agreed with it. Because I know the power of this mind of ours. So hopelessness is the attitude which kills you, which destroys your life, your happiness, destroys the planet, destroys progress, destroys harmony. It destroys everything, hopelessness. And the creative power of hope in your own health, in the future of planet Earth, the future of your whole, your family, your life, that is so important. I was talking again to somebody who came here over 30 years ago and just saw just how we started this Buddhist society in Western Australia, with nothing. And now we've got these beautiful monasteries, lots and lots of more monks and nuns than anywhere else in Australia, We've cornered the market in monks and nuns. <laughs> and coming from nothing, and how on earth did it work? That hope was an important part of it. Yeah, let's give it a try, let's see if it can happen. And it has. How on earth are people going to feed you? Why should they feed you? Monks, got no money, you don't have to feed us, why? Not in those days, you know, we didn't teach that much or you didn't know if we could teach. In fact, I was a hopeless teacher in those days. There was, I love telling this story, one of the close disciples over in Singapore, she came to visit, a bit restless, so she was in our library looking for something to do, distract herself. she probably tell me off for saying this. But she came across one of my talks from when I first came to Perth. It was on one of the old... Uh, loop cassettes. She wanted to find out in all these years, had I changed? Was I a naturally born speaker? And she listened to that and she came out to me afterwards and she said, Ajahn Brahm, that was amazing. That was the worst talk I've ever heard. <laughs> <laughs> and that was true. When I first gave talks here, people would walk out. <laughs> this is boring. But you had hope, you had this positive attitude, you kept on trying, you kept on working, you kept on doing stuff. And now we've got this incredible Buddhist society now and I have to go all over the world, I'm quite happy teaching thousands of people. Just because you had this hopeless positive attitude, it can be done, that's karma. You made it happen with this positive view about the future. And you're not stopping. You're just carrying on and on and on and on. You're making karma. So when you look at your future, the future of the world, the future of your relationship, the future of anything, if you think it's not going to work, it's going to go wrong, it's not, you know, we're going to split up, I'm going to die, the planet's hopeless, governments are all corrupt. If you think like that, you are the problem you are perpetuating that negativity. If I looked at those prisoners in jail and said, you're all criminals, you're all hopeless, you're all evil, then none of them would have ever, when released, 
got a life. Because I had hope in them, saw the beautiful side in them, and they saw that, they became beautiful, wonderful people. That's what we have for ourselves and for our world, for our health, for everything. Hope is not just some wishy-washy, Pollyanna, stupid, spiritual, mumbo-jumbo stuff. It's a very, very powerful state of mind. It's part of the law of karma. You make your future. You're making it right now. Not just with your body, your speech, but with your mind, most importantly. If you think you can, then you will. If you think you can't, there's no hope. It's one of the reasons why that once you take control and charge of your life, don't be a victim and think it's other people's fault. You can't make other people's karma for you. Your karma is your individual responsibility. By which I mean you can hope, you can see positive side. You can see the good in other people and they will show that good back to you. You can show, respect the good in politicians and then the politicians will be a better class of people. You can actually uh, see the good in any sickness. Here we go again. This is, well, I keep on repeating these stories but they mean so much to me. I'm sorry for repeating it but I get really charged with that story from the Institute of Mental Health in Singapore where I gave a keynote address once and after the keynote address this professor came up to me and said I want you to bless my unit. What do you, what's your unit? He was a professor of schizophrenia. And I asked him how do you treat schizophrenia in Singapore and that's when he said I don't treat schizophrenia in Singapore. That was interesting. You know, sometimes you get bored because people say all the same old things. But when they say something which you totally don't expect, what do you mean? You're a professor of schizophrenia, you don't treat schizophrenia. What do you do in this Institute of Mental Health? And he said, I treat the other part of the patient, the part which is not schizophrenic. And that just, it was like the sun came out in my heart. People actually were understanding seeing the Dhamma. He was actually a Catholic, but you know, he understood Buddhism better than probably I did. <laughs> and that is how things work. You've got a partner that's causing you trouble. See the other part of your partner, which is not causing you trouble. Focus on that, treat that, and that will grow. Government causing trouble. Focus on the other part of the government, which is not causing trouble. <laughs> focus on the other part of things, the positive part, the hopeful part, and that will grow. This is where we're making our world, we're making our life, we're making our journey. The journey doesn't make you, you're not a victim, you're not a passive. This is the thing with karma. There's no God up there telling you what to do, having it all planned out for you. There's no science saying it's absolutely cause and effect, there's nothing you can do to interfere. You know, it's too far. All, the, all of the signs are climate change is irreversible. No! You can do something. The mind, the human being, karma can do something. At any time. Seeing people stage four cancer, they should be dead. And they're not. Twenty years later. There's this one guy from Malaysia, he came to my monastery several years ago, stage four lung cancer, should be dead, came along, now he comes every year, every year, another year of life, another donation to my monastery. Thank you very much, Ajahn Brahm. Still keeps coming back again, should be dead. This is <laughs> this is another guy, I love this little story. He was in Sydney, I was teaching a retreat. When I was teaching retreat, you know you're supposed to be quiet when you're meditating? This guy could not be quiet. He was breathing so loudly. <laughs> so much so that people complained. Ajahn Brahm, can you please tell people to breathe quietly? 
And of course that's when I had to announce that fellow is dying of sinus cancer. He's got this huge tumour in his nose. Doctors have given up on him. Say so just nothing more we can do. You're dying. So he's coming on my meditation retreat just in case meditation might work. Nothing else to do. I don't think he was even a Buddhist. But the last day of the retreat and actually when I was just about to go back from Sydney, come back here he came up to me and said, amazing thing happened after nine days, the very end I don't know why things always happen at the very end of a retreat we should actually you know, have short retreats which end and then we do the next retreat the next day or something but always in the end of a retreat he, he said he heard a pop a popping sound he could breathe but only for one minute but that was amazing, he could actually breathe through his nose first time in months and he heard a pop and he could breathe but it closed up again and I you know, had to come back to Perth and I thought, you know, too late mate you know, before you do, you can't just study your, your textbooks the day before the exam you should have done that earlier so I actually gave up on him but you know the wonderful things in life Every now and again, you know, I travel around a lot, which is very nice, but the nice part about traveling around is that sometimes you meet these people and they come up to you and say, do you remember me? <laughs> I'd always say, no, I don't remember you because there's been too many people. And I said, I don't remember you. And he said, I'm that guy. About four years later, he said, cancer totally gone. He said, I'm spending all my life now teaching meditation to others. That's the purpose of my life now. It works. I've seen too many cases like that. The hopelessness, if you give up, you die. You can turn it around. And when you have that hope, it's amazing what you can do in life. Buddhist wise, you're taking charge of your karma, realizing your future is in your hands and you'll be amazed in how much you can do if you have that hope how you can take a stage 4 cancer or a huge tumour in your nose and it vanishes there's no limit to what you can do that is called hope thank you for listening very good Okay, now we've got some questions from overseas, probably from Mr. Trump's election campaign because I mentioned him. <laughs> See what we've got here. Okay. It's from the UK, from USA, no, it's not Mr. Trump, and from France. <laughs> here we go. My father had cancer three years ago and he has just been told that it has come back again. My parents aren't Buddhist, but I am. How can I help them myself to come to terms with impermanence? Thank you. Just because it's come back again, it went once, it's come back again, maybe it can go again. So just because it has come back again, it doesn't mean he's going to die. Keep that hope up. Take control, change your life. And it's amazing what you can do. So that journey of hope is really, really important. Cons there we go. Considering impermanence isn't hope a dangerous thing in general. How can we have hope in ways that are truly positive and beneficial considering the nature of things? Exactly. Things are impermanent, so the problem will change. It's part of nature. That however dark it is, it will become light afterwards. When I was growing up in a country like UK, in the winter time, January and February, nature looked hopeless. There was no leaves on the trees, no flowers in the ground, and even the little animals were all hibernating. You went out into the forest in January and February, and it looked like a, it had been a battleground, just dead trees everywhere. There was no life around. But you knew from experience, not so much from your your biology lectures at school, you knew from experience that all that life was waiting for a little bit of warmth and water and it will spring up and you have spring 
And so that was really important to actually to see that happen from hopelessness of winter. You see that was always followed by the incredible beauty and vibrancy and, and life which was amplified at springtime. And that's just like whenever there's a depression, whenever there's a sickness, whenever there's disappointment, whenever life is like in a winter time, it's impermanent. Winters change and become springs and summers. So that is important to remember that because we always worry about the winter times of our life. When we've broken up with the people we love, when we've lost a loved one, when there seems to be no hope in the world, when the economy just goes down, when there's wars and extremism. Those are the winter times of our civilization. It does change and become summer again, that's our nature. That gives you hope, but the problem is when things are going well, we take them for granted. Taking for granted is not hope, it's uh, heedlessness. Next one, I always think that hope is not a Buddhist value. Is hope not a way to manipulate people and project their minds into the future? Hope is a personal thing, it doesn't really connect with other people. Hope is like your contribution to the future. You don't force hope on other people. It is a Buddhist value, it's part of karma. It's positive karma, wholesome karma. It's not a way to manipulate people. Because hope is a personal thing. Fear is a way to manipulate people. Which is why a lot of sometimes governments, military, they do use fear. Why extremist groups like ISIL use fear to try and uh, manipulate people and to achieve their agendas. But hope is the opposite of fear. So from France here, I would actually say absolutely no. Fear is a way to manipulate people. Hopelessness is how to manipulate people. Hope gives people empowerment. Empowerment to actually to, to change your life, to change this world into a good way, you take control of it. Whereas fear takes your control away. So anyway, those are some of the answers here to what was uh, said from overseas. Any questions here? From here? Eddie, we always get a question from Eddie. <laughs> I hope it's a good one. <laughs> it's hard for me to express too. Uh, Ajahn Pram, very interesting talk this evening, you know, about the cancers you mentioned just now. Yeah. yeah. I often thought, you know, if scientists can take into account our Buddhist, you know, the law of dependent origination, the 12 links, for something to happen, say cancer, it depends on, you know, the, the links in it, you know, from the ignorance, yeah, or, yeah. But what I mean is, if they can look into, like, a, no, instead of uh, treating the cancer by operation or whatever, you know, if, like, 12 links, before something happens, okay, you, we need the body you now. You see what I mean? Yeah, so in those, between, what he's talking about, uh, those change things. Our, yeah, just to change the, the lifestyle, change yeah, the food, the thinking, and maybe... Because many people, the, Eddie, don't know what the 12 links are. This is just how the mind creates things. Most of those links, actually all of them just about, are just mental attitudes, mental things. And so it just shows us how the mind can actually uh, evolve and create things. It's like the law of karma just uh, described in detail. And so it is true because much of medicine is very much physical stuff. And this is actually learning just how there's this great laws of the mental world, how the mind works, how it evolves, what causes one thing after another. That is very powerful teachings. It's the interface between the mind and stuff. And if anyone wants that, P-E-A-R, the PEAR project, P-E-A-R, Google that. And uh, Princeton scientists starting off showing that the mind does have an effect on just uh, ordinary random processes, can actually skew them. Once you know it does have an effect, it just gives this mind much more importance. And it's not just science. The mind, in other words, things like hope, can interfere, can change, can do stuff. Change our lifestyle? 
change the food we eat, change the thinking, change our habits, you know. I was just thinking that way, sorry. It can change many things. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, so any other questions, please come up to ask afterwards. Oh, you got one over there? Yeah, go on. One more, yeah. Um, I, I just wonder then, because there's the other side of um, believing in you know, herbal remedies or um, just purely the mind power, is that then people don't tend to think that following the path of science or medicine is a good way to go. Um, oh, yeah. And so then, I, I mean, it can almost come across that um, purely by thinking something good is going to happen, then the, the bad things that may be going on inside of you can be overcome by that. Can you... I, yeah, I, I take your point there, that sometimes whenever you're giving a talk, you're just focusing on one aspect of sort of the world. It wasn't really just, that was just an example to the health of the body, the health of the planet, the health of your relationships, the health of you. You know, just spiritual health. That hope is really, really important there. Many other things are important too, but once you have that hope there, the other things will come along. You know, if you give up, you know, I'm going to die anyway, what's the point? And of course, you just won't do anything. You know, changing diet or health, or changing your lifestyle, of course you won't do anything. But once you realise you can do something, yeah, you, know, you only actually do take or you're saying herbal remedies or your diet or exercise, you only do that because you know there is hope. That you know you can make a difference, you can change things. The only way that we can do anything about climate change is is if we think it's hopeless, it's gone past the turning point now, it's just too late. If you think like that, of course you won't be able to. You have hope. It can be done. And this is what I've seen in my life. It's amazing, it seems to be so hopeless, but people do have hope and they turn it all around. I say it's like River Thames or destruction of great forests. So this is important. Have the hope first and all the other physical stuff will come afterwards. Without hope, it's a waste of time. That's my point anyway. But thank you for that. It's not just saying, oh, just don't go see the doctor, just sit there and just have a positive attitude <laughs> and the whole world will be okay. <laughs> okay, thank you for that. Okay, so let's now go and pay respects to Buddha Dhamma Sangha. Arahang Samma Sambo